All right. Oh my goodness, Scott, why don't you come join us? That was like a 90 minute roller coaster. <laughs> One of the things that's interesting when we do these kind of demos is that like Maddie was just, you know, thanking the demo gods for everything working. One of the things that you've always liked to do is to do demos like live and for real. Like, why is that important to you? I, I like, I don't want overproduced conferences. I want people to see that we're real developers behind real keyboards doing the real stuff like everybody else is. I, I, we're, we're just like the people in the audience. Yeah, we use our own tools to build our <clears throat> tools. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And when things don't work, why don't they work? Is it it's just the same reason they don't work when you're doing something? You forget to click a button or you didn't save something. I know that David Fowler was in the background hoping that Mads Torgerson hit control S because you got to save it before you, you know, do the demo. In a dry run, <clears throat> Dan had messed up his code a lot more and I actually enjoyed the dry run better because I got to see Dan go fix it, go, oh, what's wrong? Click, 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 click. But you, know, you miss a semicolon, forget to close a brace, forget to close a paren. We all do this all day, every day. <laughs> I think you want to have us break stuff. <laughs> uh, well, let's see if we have any questions. Um, let's pull up our, our tag board here. Um, we have tons of questions coming in from Twitter, uh, a bunch of folks tuning in. Um, a few of the questions that we had, uh, ooh, a lot of people really excited about taking pictures of David Fowler, getting excited about his demo working. While Jamie's looking for a question from the friends in the audience, I'll ask you, Scott Hunter. Um, we saw the Azure Container apps, but I'm already running containers in Azure. So like, no disrespect, but I'm a little confused because I know that there's not one size fits all, but there's a lot of choices on how to run a container in Azure. How do I pick one? Yeah, there's, there's actually too many choices. I mean, that's one of, the, one of the things that we, Microsoft, need to solve is giving better guidance to our customers. But I'll, let's say you're running Kubernetes. Well, that means you're going to pay for, in Azure, that's Azure Kubernetes service. And you're going to, you're going to pay for a bunch of VMs. Remember, you're going to pay for a control plane. That's the part of Kubernetes that's actually managing each of your containers and making sure they're still alive, routing traffic and stuff like to them. You're going to, you're going to pay for that. You're then going to pay for each of the, the virtual machines that's running your containers. If you're running an Azure container app, well, you don't have to worry about the Kubernetes part because we're managing the Kubernetes for you. You, you don't ever even see the control plane. Uh -huh. It's still running there in the cloud. You don't even pay for the control plane. Um, we pay for that for you. All you're paying for is the containers that you're running. And you saw with David's demo, his thing scaled all the way down to zero, uh -huh. which meant it was zero cost. Um, and so, uh, but in, in, a, in a nutshell, here, here's more of what I think about. Don't think about all the way to run containers. Think about what, what kind of app are you building? Uh -huh. If you're gonna build an app that has multi parts that talk to each other, then Azure Container Apps is probably the best start. Okay. Um, because it enables, because all those apps are running in the same cluster, they can all see each other. If you were building those on, let's say, uh, app service containers, well, each of those kind of lives in its own world, and it has to kind of go up to the Azure firewall and back down to, to, the, to the other side to do that. Um, and so Azure you know, Container Apps and App Service, that's great for running a single container. If you want to run multiple containers that talk to each other and don't want to worry about Kubernetes, Azure Container Apps. If you actually understand Kubernetes and you want to use that entire ecosystem of tools, then Azure Kubernetes Service. Um, and our goal is to hopefully let you be able to slide the dial. So you might start with Azure Container Apps and decide in the future that we're going to let, give you a feature where you can actually expose Kubernetes um, if you wanted to, to drive more of, of that work. I see. That makes me think of those cars that like they're an automatic shift, but they can also go left and right to have manual shift sometimes. So it's like you get the best, the best of both worlds. Yeah. That's but cool. Single app. Container apps and app service, multi apps that want to talk to each other without worrying about Kubernetes, container apps, and if you want the full Kubernetes experience, Azure Kubernetes Service. That's the way I would sum it down. Yeah, I'm not quite there. I don't want to see Kubernetes. I, I yeah. can't handle YAML, so you I like stay the way in your Azure You don't like your cube control? Not, not a fan. Not a fan. <laughs> but you know, that's the thing, right? Some people like to drive stick shift, some people like to drive automatic. That's why we have the scale. We give you that's choices, you can decide which level of control you want. Exactly. exactly. I love the flexibility. Uh, so we have a few questions. Um, so, what are the shared strings within .NET MAUI? What, uh, what's the use case? Anything that was in that, you know, when Maddie was doing some of those demos, um, there was a common place to put stuff. Mm. Um, and really, that, what, what that more is about is, hey, you're actually building four different apps, a Windows app, a Mac app, an iOS app, an Android app. And so whether it's those S SVG files, or it's strings, or anything else, what do you want to share across all those different platforms uh, is where you would stick that kind of stuff. I see, so the shared resources, shared strings, shared everything sits at the top and it's a shared 
uh, assembly for everyone, and then all the other ones kind of hang off it like in a family tree. Technically, if you really want to go deep behind the covers, maybe there actually really are still four different projects, but we just do magic in Visual Studio to actually hide that from you. Right, but it doesn't uh, matter because it feels like one, and we, you hit F5, and it works. Exactly. We give you a simplified view, but you still want to be able to share stuff across all those simplified things. That's cool. Automagically. I do, automagically. And I do want to remind folks that we are live and this is real. So put your questions at hashtag.net conf and we will feel free to answer them. And we'll also pull in some of the other demoers as well who are behind the camera. And if Scott Hunter can't handle the heat. I'll throw out something to you, Scott. Uh-oh. Isn't it amazing? I, I, seriously, I was sitting over here watching those demos and think about .NET Core 1.0 in this what, July or June or July of 2016, mm. and look what we showed today. Well, David Fowler tweeted a thing a couple of days ago where he was digging through his photos, and he found us, like, talking about uh, ASP.NET in, like, 2014, and, yeah. like, this is a long time coming, this whole thing, right? And I recently moved my blog, uh, with the help of Mark Downey, who we saw in the Visual Studio um, launch yesterday, from uh, ASP.NET 2, to ASP.NET 4, and now .NET 5, and then soon 6 in containers in Azure. So this is a 17-year-old piece of software that I've been slowly moving forward. And, and then you were saying, you know, I think people should upgrade to .NET 6. Like, you're not kidding. Like, there's a huge opportunity here for these modernization of projects. But would you, did you think when we started this, uh, actually we started at the, at the end of 20, 2013 is when we started this new journey. Yeah. Would you ever thought we would have had these Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, hybrid Blazor applications, Blazor, uh, C Sharp 10 with less, I, I'm just, I look back and I'm thinking of all the stuff we've done in these years and it's like, this, .NET 6 is an amazing product. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. And you probably knew it was possible because you came from Xamarin. So yeah. You, you had the, you had the like, we're, you're, and you're on a Mac full time, right? I am. So the idea of running um, anywhere, it was like part of your like DNA. <laughs> yeah, it was part of our origin story there. Yeah, um, and I'm actually gonna be giving a talk uh, later today around four o'clock, I think, and it's called .NET Everywhere, and I'm gonna try to show .NET running in as many places as possible, hopefully everywhere that you just described, as well as maybe Raspberry Pi's microcontrollers. You know, how many places can I run the thing on? Ooh, I'm looking I, you, You're to sending that. me pictures last night of the microcontroller. Yeah, so I, I was up. I was up pretty late trying to think how many different uh, weird th places I could run .NET. And honestly, I'm surprised that our badges still work with some of the stuff that we've gotten away with. But now we've got really strong support from our friends and other people who wear red shirts uh, to be able to pull this off. There's a few around campus. I there hear. are too many. Yeah. Uh, well, we have a few more questions. Let's see if we could get to those. All right. Is there a step-by-step -step guide on migrating from Blazor Server to Blazor WebAssembly? Mm. Do you want to migrate? That's a good Should question. Should we? You want to bring some? Feel free to pull in uh, someone if you want to phone a friend. I was going to say, I, if Dan wants to come over and, and chat, but I, I, we should we should have a conversation about Blazor Server <laughs> Blazor versus Blazor WebAssembly. Um, one of the misconceptions I think that happens is Blazor Web, WebAssembly was is the newest form of Blazor, mm -hmm. and so I think some customers go, oh, I want to be on the newest one. You really should think about it. Blaze, you know, what are the reasons you would want to use Blazor WebAssembly? Why would you use it over Blazor Server? The, the primary one of those is to build disconnected applications, you know, applications that don't require a back end. Mm -hmm. um, if you're building a regular you know, front end, back end web application, Blazor Server is a great option for you. Um, it really only is if you want that full PWA experience, disconnected PWA experience, that Blazor Server is a, is a better option. I mean, Blazor WebAssembly is a better option. So I. I do think we discount Blazor server sometimes too much. Um, it's a light, more lightweight experience, less, less bytes to the browser. You know, it's funny you, you say that because I think people use that term migration to imply that like it's better. Like migrating always means moving forward. Blazor server and Blazor WebAssembly aren't above one another. There's no thumb war happening there. It's a lateral move, right? And if you build a component, any Blazor component runs on both. And that's the cool thing. If, you build, if you're a component author and you're building components, you build a component one time and it works whether you're doing Blazor Server or Blazor right. WebAssembly. It works, as Maddie showed, in a .NET MAUI application as well, yep. uh, which is pretty cool. Um, but I don't know if, I'd have to ask Dan, if, if Dan's still here, if we have a blog post on, uh, or docs on how to migrate from server to WebAssembly. I love oh, how Dan just keeps hello. swooping in. Oh, right here. oh, yes. Hi, everyone. Yeah, sorry. Welcome. I was uh, yeah, in the kitchen, you know, drinking and eating. Oh, please. <laughs> what, what, what can I do for you? Well, so can you the... migrate from Blazor Server to Blazor WebAssembly? Is there a guide on how to do that? Oh, it's, it's, it's very simple. I mean, the components are exactly the same. So you can just take the, you can, you can just basically swap out the JavaScript. I'm a little closer oh, to the table. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can. I want to get you in good light. <laughs> 
<laughs> you can take the, the WebAssembly JavaScript file that you normally add for Blazor WebAssembly and just add it instead of the Blazor server one. And then that's usually about it. I mean, the one thing you have to be careful of is if you started with Blazor server, you can, you have the option of writing code in your components that's tied to the server environment. Like you could have connected to the database from your component. Our guidance would be, you know, try not to do that. Instead, add abstractions, like have a service layer that you can then swap out a new implementation for when you move to the client. But otherwise, the component model is the same. That, you, you brought up a great point, though. If you're building a Blazor server application, you have all of .NET 6 available to you because all of .NET 6 runs on the server. If you're running a Blazor WebAssembly application, you are running in the confines of the browser, which Within means that you can't touch the file system, you can't touch the registry if you're on a Windows device. There's lots of things you can't open or touch because you're, you're, you're constrained by that sandbox that our browsers run in. That's right, that's yeah. absolutely and, true. And I do want to add also, with all due respect to my Blazor friends, uh, I'm hearing people saying, not just can I migrate from Blazor server to Blazor client, but can I mi migrate from whatever to Blazor, implying that Blazor is the final endpoint for all web applications. That, As so that, a Razor fan, I do want to point out that the web still is a thing. Yeah. And I, I'm not going to move my blog or my podcast website, my podcast website to Blazor, because it's a web app that just uses HTML. As a Blazor fan myself, I would say also in many cases, you, you shouldn't. Like that's not the right thing to do because Blazor is really targeted towards client side web development. Like mm. think of it as the thing that you use, that you would have used JavaScript for in the past, like you know, Angular or React or jQuery right. or whatever. Exactly. You can now you do that in .NET and C Sharp. For things that you would naturally do on the server, like you want to pre-render some HTML, you want to run some logic using the full power of your server environment, you should keep doing those with ASP.NET yeah. Core. They're meant to be used together. Blazor is part of ASP.NET Core. It's not that you have to rewrite everything in Blazor. It's something that augments what you currently have. I'll give my plea. How many of us have gone to websites and the website basically launches to an empty page and you wait seven no, seconds? Well, I, I just want to make sure that we all started, in, in a lot of us uh, of a certain age, uh, started in a world uh, uh, started in the world where it was like loading pages and we don't want to get back to that and that's why you show the great optimizations that are happening to make things a lot of y'all who are watching have bigger PNGs and graphics on your home page than the blazer runtime <laughs> so nobody gets to complain about the size of that runtime but for my podcast website as an example it renders HTML it renders it quickly it's not an app it doesn't have any complex interactivity it doesn't really have anything at all so I want to remind folks you've got Worker services, you got minimal APIs, you got Razor web apps, you got Blazor apps you can make PWAs with. So we keep talking about these slider bars from one kind of container up to Kubernetes and ASP.NET includes a whole host of, of choices of which Blazor is one, Razor, et cetera, et cetera. Is that a fair statement? My, my point is more, I've seen many static web apps that actually use a client side framework for the sure. static web app and I'm like, why? It's like I go to the homepage and it says loading and it just loads regular content. I'm like, that's. You're making me wait. Could have, yeah. could have had a better user experience in some cases by just leveraging Razor the pages. server in that, in that, in that case. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right, we will let you go back to the kitchen <laughs> and appreciate you. And let's uh, find another uh, Thanks, question there. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> yeah, we have more great questions. Uh, speaking of containers. Oh, yeah. So, um, why question. use Azure Container Apps when Azure App Service for containers exists? I think I, I answered that a little bit before, but I'll repeat that again. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to build a microservice style application. If you're building a single container, App Service Container Apps is a perfect place to go host your applications. If you want to run more of these things, like I've got my front end, my back end, I've got my queue over here, it's kind of the architecture that David Fowler was showing with you earlier, earlier Scott. Mm -hmm. For those things to, to be able to talk to each other directly requires you to go configure stuff in Azure to make that work. Whether it's having IP addresses and having it jump out of the Azure firewall and back down uh, into the other, other instance, Azure Container Apps does that for you automatically because it's all running in the same cluster. Everything can see each other. And so it's great for a microservice application because not only do they see each other, they don't even go back to the Azure firewall. They actually talk directly in the same cluster to each other. Um, another benefit, uh, you know, both, both, both do the scaling. Um, but container apps will also do some of the rollback and roll forward kind of stuff as well. So you could go put a change in and say, oops, that's a bad change, roll and back. roll that back out. Mm -hmm. um, that's built directly into container apps. Uh, another cool thing that container apps has, which we did talk about today, was uh, Dapper. So if you build a container app, Dapper is, a, is an open source framework for building microservice style applications. It makes the communication between apps super easy. Uh, in fact, and it'll, it'll actually give you service discovery inside of container apps. And so that scenario of having things talk to each other, well, Dapper, you just call things by name um, and they just work. So you get Dapper by, by you know, 
for free as well in container apps. Yeah, I think that one explanation about the idea that they're all running in the same AKS cluster, they're all in the same kind of subnet, for lack of a better word, yep. makes a lot of sense. I run my podcast right now on Azure App Service for containers, but it's not a microservice-based thing. It's just a container and it's got an, an ASP.NET web app. But if I moved it over to AKS, and I mentioned before, I don't want to understand Kubernetes, I'll run it on Azure uh, apps or, uh, Azure container apps, rather. Like, if you've been watching Scott and I for a long time, for the last year and a half, we've been demoing something called Project Thai. Mm. And unknown to us, because we're building microservice apps, the only place we could run those in Azure easily, where they could all talk to each other, was Kubernetes. Yeah. Um, and so container apps will let you get that same functionality without doing the K Kubernetes side. Cool. What else we got here? Uh, you mentioned podcasts. Mm. Uh, we saw an amazing podcast app, and uh, a few folks are wondering, uh, is the code for the .NET podcast application available somewhere? The answer to that is it, yes, it will be. <laughs> yeah. If it's not live right now, uh, it will be very soon. I know it's coming. So okay. I, the, the intent was to make all the source code you saw today available to the public. So. Cool. Oh, I'm very excited so about we'll that. We'll make sure to find uh, get that out on the hashtag. So make sure that you're following that hashtag, uh, .NET Conf, and that you're also asking your questions. And be sure to ask your questions all day long because we're going to be watching this board, right? Yeah, we'll be here all day answering your questions. I think we have a few more that we could get to. Let's see. Oh, click. Ooh, Ooh. .NET 6 is very appealing. I agree. Do you have <laughs> guidance for us uh, classic ASP.NET 4.8 developers wanting to upgrade? You have, a, you have a couple choices. So number one, if you're an a ASP.NET 4.8 developer using MVC or Web API, the upgrade assistant that we showed in the, in the keynote will, will, will help you translate those applications. Those app types translate very, very well over to uh, .NET 6. If you're a web form customer, um, it's a little more complicated because there's not a, a replacement for web forms in uh, .NET 6. That said, there is a, uh, if you go to dot.net, our website, under the architectural guides at the very top of the, 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 the site, there is a whole uh, book written on how to convert a web form application to a Blazor application. And the reason I, we're mapping web forms in Blazor is because they both have component models. Mm -hmm. If you're a web form developer, you have a series of controls. Um, I mentioned the, the Fluent UI control pack today, 40 controls. There's a bunch of control vendors that have controls. Um, and so web forms and Blazor kind of map the best. And uh, I think Dan actually co-authored that, 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 that uh, book. But there's a book on how to do that. So if you're MVC, Web API, Use the upgrade assistant. If you're web forms, go check out the book that uh, is on the website. Yeah, and, and going to Blazor server is really natural, surprisingly natural for web forms folks. And uh, just as an alternative option for those that are maybe a little bit more, uh, more well factored, uh, I use that example of our blog, which is called DAS blog, D-A-S blog, which is German for the blog. And Mark Downey took the front end of that, which was in uh, web forms, slowly moved it over to Razor pages. And then the back end, because it was already cleanly factored .NET code, it actually hasn't changed in 17 years. And it was just a straight port over by making a new project and copying things over. So you, you do have multiple paths and multiple choices. We're upgrading. Yeah, cool. We've only got about two more minutes. So let's try one more question one as we get ready. Question. And then we'll do a little bit of housekeeping as well if we see if we have enough time. OK, yeah. Let's see. More container apps or Mac? A lot of great questions. Well, we got, uh, will it all work? Great uh, part of our team. Can we use Blazor WASM pre-entering? Oh, there's an appreciation one actually here. Uh, hot reload still looks like magic. Uh, it, it isn't magic though. It's all actually open source and you can see how it works if you want to. Yeah, it's, it's not magic and interestingly enough, you know, hot reload was something that's, it's, it's a continuation of edit continue. Uh -huh. And for folks that have been around a long time, when we first shipped .NET back in 2002, we had a feature called Edit and Continue where you could put a, uh, start the application in the debugger, put a breakpoint in, and when a breakpoint hit, you could go change some code. The difference between Edit Continue and Hot Reload, they're actually using some of the same underlying technology, hmm. but Hot Reload does not require you to start the debugger, which is the, to me, is the big, big win. You just run the application and start changing code. But I, I do want to be, be, you know, you showed, when Dan showed it, he showed where the tool kind of informed him that, hey, the change he made was too big and had to restart. I will tell everybody, Hot Reload is going to be a, a journey for us. This is the first step. And please try it and give us feedback on what doesn't work um, so we can actually continue to modify it to make it work in more scenarios. And in some cases, you need something we, we, that we've not done yet, which we call Hot Restart, mm. 
which is uh, what if you do make a change like the beginning of, a, of an application like the, the main method? Well, that code's already run, so if you can change it, but it's not gonna run again. And so we're also investigating what we call hot restart, where we can actually restart the application in the same process, which means even a restart is way faster than it was before. Right. So imagine a sub one second restart. So there's a lot of work we're gonna do in this area. It's, it's a lot of improvements happening. Yeah. Yeah. The innovation does not stop. I am being told that we don't actually have time for the, uh, for the housekeeping slides. We'll have to come back to those during our next break, if that's okay with you, Jamie? Yes, we'll come back to them. Cool, thank you, Scott Hunter. Thank you. Uh, and uh, that's very cool, Jamie. Thanks for uh, helping me out here. We're gonna be with you all, to, all day today, Jamie and I, uh, uh, checking out your questions, answering your questions. Now we're gonna turn it over to Mads Torgerson and Dustin Campbell. They're gonna talk about what's new in C-Sharp 10. Take it away.